Wonderful job in worship and what a great transition to our time in God's Word. Uh, two passages that will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as we talk about the body of Christ and Philippians chapter 1. So 1 Corinthians 12 and Philippians 1 and as you grab your sermon notes guide you can jot down those things that resonate with you as we talk about the fact that God has put the body of Christ that is the church together in such a way that we are many individuals bringing many gifts to the table, but at the same time, it is one spirit, the spirit of the living God, that guides us to work together for his glory and honor. And so as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, some of you are familiar with this text. Uh, In the beginning of chapter 12, he's talking about the fact that there is a diversity of gifts, a diversity of ministries that God calls his people to, and yet at the same token, it's all for the good of the whole. That there's no reason that you should be jealous of another person's giftedness or another person's ministry. I mean, that's what that person is doing with the strength of the Lord and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But God has also called you to find your place of giftedness and to reach out and to minister to others in his name. We pick up in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12, and the apostle uses the analogy of a body, which is so perfect, and we can understand it so well. He says in verse 12, For as the body is one, and yet it has many members, but all of the members of that one body, being many, are one body. You're going to see this stress time and time again. Many members, one body. Many parts, one whole. I mean, that's what he's getting at here. You fit in to the body of Christ, and God wants to use you. And he says at the end of verse 12, just like your body functions, so also is the body of Christ. So also is the church of Jesus Christ. For verse 13, by one spirit we were baptized into one body. Now whether you come from a religious background, which is when he says there, whether a Jew or a Greek, it doesn't matter. You've come to God in the person of Jesus Christ. So whether you come with a religious background that actually is correct. I mean, Judaism is the roots of Christianity. I mean, that, and so when you understand what God was doing in the Old Covenant, you have an, a better appreciation for what he has done in the New Covenant in Jesus Christ. So whether you're coming from a religious background and you understand kind of the essence of what we're getting at here, or whether you come from a pagan background, you're a Greek, and you had no understanding of these things, but God has moved you through the power of the Holy Spirit, the reality is we've all come to the same place, and that is before Christ Jesus. And now, not just with respect to your religious background or lack of, but also with respect to your social status. Doesn't matter whether you are a slave or whether you're free. Doesn't matter whether you're at the 1% or you're part of the 99%. Doesn't matter. What matters is, are you surrendered to the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what matters. And we come as many different parts, many different gifts, many different different backgrounds, but we all come, as verse 13 ends, to drink into one spirit. When we partake of communion, as we will on Wednesday night, we drink into one union, and that is the union that we have in Jesus Christ. His blood spilled for us, his body broken for us. Now, it's important to remember in our day and age of of pluralism that Christianity is the most adaptable of all of the religious systems out there in the sense of the essence of what we're teaching in Jesus Christ can be applied to any community, any culture, any time. But in our pluralistic day and age, there is a big difference between interdenominational work or an interdenominational approach to faith and an interfaith approach. What's the difference? An interdenominational approach to faith would be to say that I believe that within all of the denominations of Christianity, doesn't matter if you come from an Episcopalian background or you are an Episcopalian or a Lutheran or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a Catholic or Dutch Reform or or Baptist or you call yourself non-denominational. If you have surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, You're seeking to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit and your worldview is determined by a biblical view of things, then you're part of the body of Christ. There's not one denomination within Christianity that has a lock hold on all of the truth of Scripture. Every denomination has its weakness, 
Every denomination has its strengths. And yet, it's very different, though, when you start talking about, oh, well, I'm, I'm interfaith. Now you've stepped outside the realm of Christianity to where now you're saying, well, interfaith, I believe that all ways essentially will reach to God. So if a person happens to be Muslim, it is God is reaching them through Islam, or God may be reaching a person through Buddhism, or God may be reaching a person through Christianity. But really, it's all the same thing as people are trying to pursue God. That is an interfaith worldview, and that clearly is not consistent with what the scriptures teach. The scriptures teach that God benevolently sent his son to die for you and me, to die for the world, and that a relationship with God comes through his Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now, should we be compassionate and be willing to work with people of other faiths? Certainly. That's what we're called to do, to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when we start to talk about salvation, we have to make sure that we have a biblical worldview And that our teaching is biblically based. There is one body, there is one spirit, there is one God, there is one Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ the Lord. For verse 14, in fact, the body is not one member, but many. We come from a lot of different backgrounds. And we all need one another. In, In the next pericope, the next section, verses 15 to 24, he uses this great analogy of, well, consider your body. You know, when you look at your body and you see all the different parts, yet those different parts are intricately connected to one another, the hand can't say, well, you know, know, I'm not a foot, I'm not part of the body, or vice versa, or the eye shouldn't say, well, I'm not an ear, so I'm not part of the body, or the ear, I'm not an eye. No, it all works together for the good of the whole. If the whole thing were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole thing were an ear, where would, you know, where would be the the, uh, seeing? And so you, you look at this, and it's so true that God brings us together in order for his kingdom to flourish and grow through us. And yet, we're also connected in our struggles and in our strengths. Look, if you would, at verse 24. Where at the end of verse 24, he says, God has composed the body in such a way that we give greater honor to the part which lacks. Now you say, what does he mean by that? What essentially he's getting at is we give greater honor to those parts of our bodies that are infirm, where we have a weakness, where we have a struggle, where we have a difficulty, where we have a sickness. Say, well, how is that? Very, very simple. Stub your toe, real small part of the body. Let's not even go with the toe, the biggest of the the digits there on your foot. Let's go with the, the pinky toe. And there you are getting ready for bed, and you're cruising through the bedroom at a pretty good clip. And what do you do? Wham! Do you just like go on like nothing happened at all? Now, some of you might even say a few things that I can't say from the pulpit, right? Because it stops you right in your tracks. Ho! That was just the little toe. Or let, what about even something smaller? Take an eyelash, part of your body, comes off and it goes in your eye. That'll stop you, won't it? That might even get you to pull off to the side of the road. Stop your vehicle and everything because of a little eyelash that goes into your eye. You give honor to those parts. That is, you give attention. Do you give very, you know, diligent attention to the parts of your body that are infirm? And so we should, as well as the body of Christ, encourage one another. As it says there, there would be no schism at all. There would be no division in the body. That all of the members would be working together for the good of the whole. That verse twenty-six: If one part is suffering, the whole thing is suffering. If one part is rejoicing or is being honored, then everything is rejoicing and being honored. We are a part of the body of Christ, but we are also individual, uniquely designed by God to bring a certain set of of talents, to bring a certain understanding, to bring a certain background to this experience that we're sharing in together that is Christianity. And interestingly, we're not just members of one body in our present day and age. We are a part of an eternal body that spans right through the ages. And it reflects the timelessness of our God. Would anyone argue that the great apostle who writes this epistle to the church in Corinth has really no part and no influence in our lives today at the beginning of the 21st century? No. Our our lives have certainly been impacted by the apostles thinking, by the apostles writing, by the apostles living. And likewise, how about the Protestant reformers of of the 1500s, of the 16th century? 
would we say, ah, they, they're completely irrelevant to us. No, they're directly relevant to us because their way of thinking, which brought about a reformation in the church, is a, 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 we are a direct product of their way of thinking. We're living out what God was doing in and through them. And how about the Elizabethans that have gone before us and so faithfully served the Lord? I think of Dr. Zeno Wall, the late Zeno Wall. He's the only man in the history of North Carolina Baptists to have served as a, a pastor of, a prominent, of prominent congregations in North Carolina. He was the pastor, longtime pastor of First Baptist in Shelby. He was our pastor here at Elizabeth for a while. But he also served as the president of Gardner-Webb at one time. He also served as the president of the North Carolina Baptist State Convention. And he also served a stint as the president of the North Carolina Baptist Children's Homes. It's incredible leadership. There is no one in the history of North Carolina Baptist that has done all of those things like Dr. Zeno Wall did. And when he came to the place in his life where he was saying goodbye to the things of this world and he knew that the Lord was transitioning him to, to his eternal kingdom, where did he decide that he would be laid to rest? He, he and his wife decided he would be laid to rest right behind me here. If you go behind our church, and you have a, a road that goes through our cemetery. You go to the other side of the road. And when you go on the other side of the road, if you'll look back at the church and you'll orient yourself to the steeple, which is oriented to the pulpit, you'll walk right to Zeno Wall's grave. And that, that, that wasn't coincidence that he had that plot placed right there, right on line with the church that he was so much a part of. It was during his tenure that our church burned in the 1950s, and it was his leadership that allowed this facility to be built as the body of Christ came together to rebuild this building that we love to come and worship in. Of all of the things that he experienced, of all of the organizations and the people that he led, what he wanted to do at the end of his life was be laid to rest here with you Elizabethans. That says a lot about the body of Christ here at Elizabeth. And as we see in the next section, verses 28 to 31, Dr. Wall had his gifts, his talents, but there are many talents and gifts, and you have yours. There are apostles in the church. There are prophets. There are teachers. There are those who can work miracles. We don't see that very often. We'd like to see it more on the mission field. They seem to see it more often, but then there's those who have the gift of healings, those who have the gift of help, like the Eubank family that you saw the video of. What an incredible, incredible dedication that they have to helping people who are in the most dangerous places in the world. And how about some of you who are incredibly well organized? That's a gift from God. And, and you need to use that gift of organization to somehow bless the ministry of the body of Christ. And yet he goes on in verses 29 and following, asking the rhetorical question, is everyone an apostle? Does everyone prophesy? Is everyone a gifted teacher? Does everyone work miracles? Does everyone have the gift of healings? Does everyone speak with tongues? No. The answer is no, 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 no. Uh, there, we don't all do these things because we have to do different things in order for the whole body to move forward, just like your physical makeup. And yet he says at the end of the chapter, in verse 31, I love this. Earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then we transition to chapter 13, which remember, when, when the letter was written to the Corinthians, there are no chapter verse designations. So he flows right into this more excellent way of living. Certainly it's excellent to live out your gifts and your talents where you understand how God wants to use you to further his kingdom. But I'm telling you, if you're going to do that, wonderful, but there's an even more important thing that you need to do. And that is love. You need to love God and you need to love his people and you need to love people in the name of the Lord that are outside the body of Christ. Look at what he says in 13.1. Though I speak with tongues, the, both the tongues of men and the tongues of angels, but if I don't have love, I'm like a, a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand mysteries and all knowledge, and essentially you can be a, a, not only a, a, a prophet, but you can be a teacher. If you can do all of these things and have great faith and even move mountains but not have love, if you don't have love, you don't have anything, he says. And so the most excellent way for us to live our lives according to God's truth in his holy word is to not only understand the gifts and the talents that he's given us, but to use those gifts and talents lovingly to further his holy kingdom. 
As I look back over 15 years of ministry here at Elizabeth, that passage in Philippians 1, I want you to turn to verses 3 through 7. It is certainly the way I feel toward you as a congregation, as my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, as we journey together, all of us with our shortcomings, all of us with failures at times, all of us acknowledging our own sinfulness, but also having great opportunities of success, seeing God do some incredible things before us, and knowing that the Holy Spirit is leading us on to even greater things that we don't have complete clarity on yet, but that clarity will come as we are obedient in following him. The apostle writes to the Philippians in Philippians 1.3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making request for you with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the very first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. That first line of that section of scripture, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, and I do. I think of those who have gone before us to the kingdom. I think of Buford Self, who was so instrumental when I first came here. Buford knew everything about this campus, and he wanted this campus to function well uh, for the people of Elizabeth to be able to come and to worship, not having to worry about problems and difficulties of facilities and maintenance. Buford, he worked until he was 85 years old. I, Shannon and I went to his retirement party. 85 years old when he retired. He was a poster Marine, and I say it literally because when he served during World War II, there was a recruitment poster that was put, about, put out by the Marine Corps, and guess who was right there front and center, square jaw and everything, Mr. Buford Self. And it was a joy to watch when we renovated this sanctuary and changed this pulpit area as Buford got out the plans, and he had so long to see this sanctuary go through a renovation, and he, during the process, he passed his knowledge and his leadership and his expertise in that area over to Jerry Gardner. And then as the years, I've watched Jerry Gardner pour everything he knows, and I've watched him hand over uh, detailed sketches and architectural designs of the church and, and everything that goes on, so behind the scenes to make everything happen on Sundays and Wednesdays and other days, he's passed it on to many others, to where now you've got Steve, Steve Borders and Doug Engel that are working so hard in the same spirit as Jerry, in the same spirit as Buford, to make sure that this campus and the things that are done on this campus that are done as unto the Lord. I think of Billy Wilson, who is uh, his namesake, his ancestor, Elizabeth Love Wilson, was one of the founders of this church, and she gave the land uh, that this church was to be built on. I can remember when we first came here to Elizabeth, and, and Billy came up to Shannon one day and said, how did you like the corn I dropped off at your house? And Shannon said, corn? I don't, we didn't get any corn. He said, no, I dropped a whole thing of corn off at your house. And she said, I, I didn't see it. And he said, well, don't you live at such and such a place? Shannon said, well, that's our neighbor's. So, well, the next day, Mr. Wilson showed up with a bunch of corn at our house, and, and he sat down, and Shannon and Mr. Wilson sat on the back porch and shut corn, and he started to tell her about the history of Elizabeth and about his own family, and when he talked about his family, he cried. Here's an old 82nd Airborne Division paratrooper, but because of the way he loved the Lord, and he loved this church and loved his family and wanted to share that with the new pastor's wife, he, he cried. I think of Fred Mooney. We had two Fred Moonies. I don't know what that is. We, got, we have duplicate names with numerous people over the years. But we had banker Fred Mooney, and we had preacher Fred Mooney, who I just read from his book. Some of you were here the Wednesday night, that banker Fred, not expecting it at all, pulled out after a Wednesday night service and didn't even get down to the next road intersection and had a heart attack in his car and passed away. Some of you are here when preacher Fred Mooney with his one really hairy hand. I mean, I don't know why the Lord did that. He looked like a hobbit on the one side. The other hand was just normal as anything. But nonetheless, he was a character. And the same thing with Zeno Wall took place with Mr. and Mrs. Reverend Fred Mooney. Um, they were coming to the end of their lives. And he, said, he asked me to come by and visit with them one day. They had some important things to talk about. 
And he said, you know, as Martha and I have sat down and discussed where do we want to be laid to rest after all the years we've served the Lord and all the different churches we've been at, we would like to be laid to rest at Elizabeth. It says something special about the body of Christ here. Mrs. LaRue Poston, whose faithfulness to WMU and to the ministries of EBC, and those of you that knew Miss LaRue Poston, she lived a very hard life in some ways. But boy, did the love of Jesus shine through and the smile on her face, despite the difficulties that she went through. And I think of those who not only have gone before us to the kingdom, but I think of those who continue to faithfully serve, Mrs. Joyce Bean, who has taken on a legacy of faith that's been passed down to her, and then she's turned around and facilitated that with all of her children, who continue to serve wonderfully in the ministry in different capacities. I think of Reverend Jeff Brendel, who's the only other pastor of Elizabeth that is alive today. And how even though he's still involved in another congregation, another strong congregation here in our area, he always comes and supports the things that we're doing here at EBC because he loves what the Lord has done through this church. I think of Derek and Gina Dellinger. They just celebrated 34 years of marriage. I don't know how they did that, being 40 years old each, but nonetheless... (laughs) Derek was a part of the finance team when I first came here, and to watch him continue on the finance team at this capacity today is wonderful. Not that he's served the whole time. He's rotated off for numerous, numerous years. But to see the consistency and the faithful leadership that he has brought. Think of Danny Gant. I think of Eddie Green, Gary Hastings, uh, those deacon chairs that have served so faithfully, and then at the same token, especially in the case of Danny Gant and Eddie Green, have realized, I want to raise up a younger generation of deacon chairs, and then in- encouraging them to step into roles and serve, like Matt McPherson being our vice chair at this time of the deacon board. Indeed, I thank God for every remembrance of you. And as the apostle goes on, he says, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. One of the joys of a long pastorate or a longer pastorate is watching the changes that take place in the lives of our young people. Our young people that will walk across the stage for high school graduation this June were three when I came to Elizabeth. And many of you, I watched you graduate from high school. Some of you went right into your careers. Others of you went to college. Some of you decided to make a career at college and stay a little bit longer than most. (laughs) And then you came home. I've married you. I've watched now your children come along. We've dedicated your children to the Lord. What an incredible joy it has been. And now you're in your mid-30s, roughly, and I'm listening to you sometimes have conversations with one another about your ailments as you feel that you're aging. (laughs) And all I've got to say is, those of us that were in our mid-30s 15 years ago, and you can do the math, we're approaching the big 5-0, you've got a lot more to look forward to as the years go on. (laughs) But in all seriousness, your fellowship in the gospel from the very first day until this very day has been an absolute joy. And for that reason, I say with the apostle, I am confident of this very thing, that he who has done a good work in you, The Lord that has put us all together, all of us for for this time, for such a day as this, he will complete this work until the day of Jesus Christ. And we are very, very blessed. At a time when many churches are in decline, God has allowed us to grow and to flourish. Some of you get the biblical recorder. That's our state Baptist newspaper uh, that came out yesterday. This is the February 22 edition. And here is an article on church revitalization. Listen to some of these statistics. The North American Mission Board reports that 70 to 75% of Southern Baptist churches in North America are either plateaued or are declining. And Tom Rainier says that 9 out of 10 churches in America, regardless of denomination, are declining. Or they are growing, but more slowly than their communities. When communities are growing but churches are not, that is a sign that we are not impacting lostness in that community. Rainier also reported in January of 2018, that year, between 6,000 and 10,000 churches were closing per year. And that number is increasing. That was two years ago, uh, churches were closing of all denominations at the rate of six to 10,000 per year. And to bring it home, 
LifeWay has reported that here in our North Carolina Baptist State Convention, 82.4% of the churches have either plateaued or are in decline. All of that is based upon the annual church profile data that is submitted to the convention every year, and we're a part of submitting our information every year. Here's the last sentence in this part of the article, and it says it all. The numbers are staggering. And then you add to that that the average pastoral stay at a church in the North Carolina Baptist State Convention is two and a half years, with the vast majority of those separations between the pastor and the congregation being a result of some kind of duress, either something the pastor's done and has to resign, or the church is just dysfunctional and is asking the pastor to resign, or it's a combination of super dysfunction with both pastor and church. But when you have that going on, friends, our work is cut out for us. And yet at the same time our work is cut out for us, we must be very, very thankful for what God is doing here at EBC and the way he has put us together to serve. You have a wonderful staff. Lori Hastings and Crystal Bryson as our co-children's ministers. You're not going to find better children's ministers across the state of North Carolina. Wonderful, wonderful people who love your kids and love the Lord and know what they're doing when it comes to working with kids. David Putnam, our youth minister, who's been with the young people on our winter retreat. I'm reading through the book again, and, and I come across this. This is the uh, first 100 years of Elizabeth. Believe it or not, I'm reading this paragraph. Our present minister to youth, David Putnam, came to the position on March 31, 1980. Now, granted, he went away from the position for numerous years, but he never went away from the church, as he always maintained his membership here as he grew up at EBC. And he is still with our youth. I think when whoever kicks out the saints at Elizabeth their first 200 years, somehow David Putnam's still going to be the youth minister. <laughs> but we have Eddie, Eddie and Anita coming to join us, and Eddie bringing his expertise in the area of discipleship and administration. Mike, who had such a wonderful tenure as our music minister, though he has retired, Sharon now is coming, stabilizing us in such a wonderful way with her gifts and her talents in music ministry. I mean, we, we are so, our administrative team as well. Angel, the newest of our staff members, uh, full-time staff members, she's so creative as the one that takes care of all of our publications. Uh, Kay James, who is our receptionist, you can't find a sweeter lady to answer the phone or greet you when you walk through those doors. And then Kim McIntyre, who is our accounting manager, she is a phenomenal, phenomenal organizer. When you talk about the gift of administration and organization, I've never seen an accountant and administrator at the Citadel in my military days or any of the churches I've served that's as good as Kim McIntyre. You are blessed. And our recent addition as Reverend Jim Brackett, longtime and faithful pastor to uh, many churches in our community, is now transitioning into a position with us of our uh, minister, assistant minister of senior adults and pastoral care. God's blessed us. And you are a part of that blessing. As the worship team comes up to close out our service, I just I leave you with this. As you consider what the Lord is doing here, as you consider the, the leadership, I've said it before, I say it today, f over 15 years of deacons meetings, and I've never walked out of one upset as if the meeting went off the tracks and we dishonored the Lord by getting upset with one another. Never once have we disagreed. Of course we disagree. You have strong leaders in our church, but we've always walked out. Though we might have many opinions... We serve one Lord, and we serve him together. And so as the apostle concludes saying, it is right for me to think this of you, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch in both my chains, and that is our chains, the struggles and the difficulties that we go through, but also in our defense and confirmation of the gospel, we are partakers of the grace of God together. Years ago, when we raised the flags on our campus and we put the Christian flag on top, Symbolically, I can't think of a better defense and proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ than to say, Jesus is Lord and there is no other, and we serve God even before we serve our own beloved country and government. I remember Jerry Gardner as a deacon in the meetings as we were making the decision to fly our flags that way, and he said, this is going to get a lot of attention, I think. He said, I think we might even end up on Fox News or something like that. Yeah. But, Guess whose picture was on Fox News? Very first one they interviewed was Jerry Gardner. So little did he know, he also had the gift of prophecy. 
but we do it together. Together, God is bringing many gifts to the life and the work of EBC, but the work is accomplished by the leadership of one spirit, and that is the spirit of the living God. Let's continue for another 15, as our best days will still be ahead of us. Uh, as you, I want to bring your attention as you get ready to sing our closing song. In a couple uh, months, we're going to have a ministry fair. These logos are all the different ministries that we have in our church. Many gifts coming together for one purpose. If you're not plugged into the life and work of Elizabeth, fill this out. Leave it on the table in the foyer as you're departing or bring it by the office later this week. Give it to a staff member. Give it to your Sunday school teacher. Uh, but, but get involved. God has you here for a reason. Get involved in furthering the kingdom of God through what he's doing in and through us here at Elizabeth. And we'll give you the dates uh, in the months ahead for that ministry fair. We want you to be a part of that because we want you to be a part of the great things that God's doing.